Welcome to People Tech, the podcast of the HCM Technology Report. I'm Mark Pfeffer. Today we're talking to Bas van der Harder. He's a speaker, author, and advisor on assessment, recruiting, and the influence of technology on work and society. We'll talk about the different approaches to candidates and employees that he sees between Europe and the United States, and a lot more, all on this edition of People Tech. Boss, it's great to see you. There's a lot going on in the world today. When you look across the ocean, between the Netherlands and the United States or North America, what do you see that's that's common or what's different? Um, especially when it comes to talent acquisition. Oh, Mark, there's so much different. The more I learn about America, the crazier I think your country is, to be honest. If you look at some employment laws, which are, uh, on the one hand, by far smarter than ours, and on the other hand, really not. So it's... Uh, if you look at, for example, your discrimination laws that uh, you need an 80 percent um, from different ethnicities in the Netherlands, if you ask somebody for its ethnicity, <laughs> you're screwed. There is no I mean, you go, can't get fined more. On the other hand, if you look at actual labor market discrimination, the number of people in the Netherlands who've been convicted for this is one. And the only reason this guy got convicted was because he gave an interview with the local newspaper saying, "Of course, I'm not saying the woman is useless, but trucking is a man's job. So of course I re- rejected her on, on the fact that she's a woman. And that's the only time somebody ever got convicted for any form of labor market discrimination in hiring in the Netherlands because we have all these laws, they're just completely non-enforceable. And you have laws which are from a talent acquisition perspective, sometimes a bit strange because you're looking at ethnicity and not taking quality into effect there, yet enforceable. So it's, it's really interesting that we have much better laws that are just not enforceable, yet you have Technically speaking, lesser laws on labor market discrimination, yet enforceable. Um, But the way you treat people is also very different because a fixed contract here is a contract and it's really hard to fire somebody. While in the US, um, it's really so much easier to fire somebody. So you're spending a lot less time on getting quality of hire right. do you do you think there's a great difference in the way diversity and inclusion is handled in Europe versus in the United States? Without a doubt. And um, to give you an example, um, we still talk about it like probably you did in the 1980s. You are at least 20, maybe 30 or 40 years ahead of us. At least in America, there's a debate going on. At least you're accepting um, historic racial injustices and there's now a movement trying to fix it. Um, The interesting thing is if you look at, and this was a a meta study done by Northwestern, um, the three most uh, labor market discriminating countries in the world, in the Western world are France, Sweden, and the Netherlands. And everybody says, but Sweden and the Netherlands, you're so inclusive and you're so egalitarian. Yeah, and because we believe we are, our unconscious bias is 20 times as much. You can't uh, talk about it. Uh, Every time it comes up, people are like, well, that's just, it's basically the 1980s, 1990s in the US for as far as public debate is going. So, um we see yeah the, the discussion here is still very very low-key while in america um 
I see a lot more movement on this. You are known for your work in assessments and, and being an expert on assessments. Do assessments have a role in fighting that kind of issue? Oh, absolutely. I think assessments are the key to solving the issue because it turns out, uh, Mark, that everywhere where they are implemented well, and this is the important part where we implement them well, quality of hire and diversity go up because, gosh, talent doesn't stick to racial, ethnic or sexual orientation lines. And everywhere that I've seen an assessment tool being used in the right way, which basically means is let's figure out the traits which somebody needs for this job. Let's measure those traits in a scientifically valid manner. And let's start hiring based on those tests. You see diversity going up on each and every measure. I've seen here in the Netherlands, KPMG, uh, early graduate recruiting going from f- uh, 33% to over 40% women. Um, because all of a sudden it turns out these women have the same leadership capabilities, just the middle-aged white men like us didn't think they have it when they were starting with interviews. I've seen it in um, Grant Thornton, the accountant organization in the UK, where they did away with all educational requirements for their internships, and they just started doing aptitude testing. And you know what? Even your math grade in high school doesn't tell me if you are good at math, because if you need three jobs to sustain your family, your your grades will be lower because you don't have the time to do the homework. And they started doing this aptitude testing. All of a sudden, they started getting in candidates, which, according to the tests, were really good from, as their head of recruitment told me, neighborhoods or partners wouldn't park their BMWs. And um, these people, and they've been doing this now for seven or eight years, and she told me these people are, which we hired, um, and we would have never given even a chance when we were looking at grades and educational attainment, they clock more billable hours and they stay longer at the company. They're the most most profitable employees we have. Hires previously wouldn't stand a chance when the resume and education was important. And we were training them anyway We had internships, we had trainee programs to get people up to assistant accountant. So that was nothing new. We were just spending it on the privileged people who didn't need a job next to their studies and were able to have a a really high GPA. Um, So yeah, without a doubt, and I've, honest to God, I mean, if you look at, for example, racial injustice in the Netherlands, we have the biggest discrimination against Muslims. Basically, um, a Muslim name will give you a 30% chance of getting selected compared to a name like Bas, which is a typical Dutch name. One third chance. Using these tests, we saw them with the exact same chance. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. So you, you were talking before about how in the world of DEI, the United States is further ahead than the Netherlands. Does that same formula hold up when it comes to assessments and 
in general, which which place or which group of people are using assessments the the most appropriately? Um, to be honest, it's really difficult. I, um, we don't see a massive uptake of assessments in the Netherlands, only in certain areas. Um, we have two types of high volume jobs, basically um, retail staff and contact center work where assessments are really common because there's one assessment provider who focused on that and the ROI was just so ridiculously high that right now it's hard not uh, to use it because then your manager will ask you why are, and do we still have that many bad hires? Why do we still have this attrition? Um, if all our competitors lowered it by a factor of five sometimes using these tools. I mean, I've seen them go down down from 100% attrition a year to 20% just by selecting the right people. Um, on the other hand, um, the Dutch used to have assessments for the very last candidate. So basically we've already made our decision, but now we need to make sure somebody else externally signs off on our decision so we can't be blamed for hiring this person. That was the way the Dutch used the assessments. So taking them to the first step of the selection process is very difficult. In the US, you see more early testing um, because of your, your labor laws that gives you a better uh, position in court, basically. It's, it's, America, in America, HR is about keeping you out of court. In the Netherlands, HR is about making your people flourish because you never go to court. <laughs> Only if you fire somebody for, and even then it's, it's a great big mess. You know, um, the, the, the most common court cases, I think, on the Dutch labor market are systems engineers who watch too much porn. That, 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 that's basically it. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's interesting that, you know, to say in the States, HR's job is to keep you out of court. Um, why are they so, why are the approaches so different? Well, um, first of all, this is what I hear from, well, among other, other podcasts and articles I read that that's the basic line for HR. But in America, first of all, you sue a lot more. Mm. I mean, I got fired twice and we never even considered going to court. We were just, we sat down at a table and just negotiated until we found an agreement that we were both comfortable with simply because going to court is expensive, time-consuming, takes up too much negative energy. We, we'll do anything to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, only if one or both parties are genuine dicks, <laughs> we'll go to court. While in America, the first thing which happens is, I'll sue your ass. So you, you simply have that culture more. You also have the laws that make it possible. Like I said, we have only one person ever been convicted of labor market discrimination, ever, in the entire history of the Netherlands. And we're an older country than you are. Um, in America, I've actually noticed from a few of my friends who started their businesses in the US, they say we have at least three lawsuits for not hiring somebody based on ethnicity or sexual orientation or whatever at any given time mm -hmm. because people just sue because your laws allow it to. Right. And then it becomes HR thing, uh, HR's position to keep you out of court while in the Netherlands, we usually just have a legal department, which everybody hates, um, who basically just says, well, GDPR, yeah, we'll get away with that. Or, no, we won't get away with it. We need to do it like this. Um, last question. There's a lot going on right now in talent acquisition in, in, and in every nook and cranny of talent acquisition. 
What are the things that you're most interested in? What are, what are the things that are going on that you think are going to be the most impactful? Well, uh, of course, uh, assessments, I think, are going to be very impactful because, Mark, think about, first of all, getting into those untapped pots of talent, untapped pools of people which are really talented, which have the aptitude, just never had the chance to show it. And um, also, if um, a big difference probably, again, between our countries is we have a lot of people in burnout. We have a really good um, mental um, laws about mental illness, which basically uh, gives you the chance to be sick. We have really good uh, sick leave laws. You know, you, you can't be fired if you're sick. You can't ask anybody if they've ever been sick, stuff like that. Uh, an employer doesn't even know what's going on with, um, with the employee. You're not allowed to ask. But we have a lot of people in burnout. And the only reason you are in burnout is because you're in the wrong place. I mean, nobody gets burnout from working too hard. You get burnout from doing the wrong job either above your talent or with the wrong talent or in a company which just doesn't suit you. And if we were able to make better fit between what's required of you and what you are actually doing and capable of, that would so dramatically increase employee happiness and decrease um, burnout. It's just so, and I'm actually seeing some research coming in on this now from assessment providers who say like, we can reduce your burnout rate from between 30 and 60%, simply because we'll look at what somebody's most natural qualities and we'll see if they fit in the job. Um, so I see amazing opportunities uh, on, on that front. Um, and of course, the entire data revolution, uh, AI. Um, I don't believe recruiters will ever be replaced. I do believe that recruiters will be augmented with really, really smart technology, which is going to take away some aspects. For example, assessing if somebody's somebody has a certain traits, certain character traits, certain qualifications, because we know that humans are actually really crap at that. Um, only a trained psychologist is able to assess somebody's characteristics. And Google actually did a um, research on this on their own staff and nobody within Google was able to select somebody with a 50% uh, or higher rate on talent. Nobody was right. It, it was better just flipping a coin to see who you should hire than have one person assess the other person. That's why they have the rule of four because apparently four people thinking the same, that actually counts for something. And they actually took the hiring manager out of that equation because the hiring manager has a tendency to see talent which isn't there because he feels the pain of not having his seat filled. Right. So um, what if we just measure if somebody fits? So that I'm seeing awesome uh, developments there. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's for me the most interesting part. Bas, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. My guest today has been Bas van der Hardert, and this has been People Tech, the podcast of the HCM Technology Report. We're a publication of Recruiting Daily. We're also a part of Evergreen Podcasts. To see all of their programs, visit www.evergreenpodcasts.com. And to keep up with HR technology, visit the HCM Technology Report every day. We're the most trusted source of news in the HR tech industry. Find us at www.hcmtechnologyreport.com.
Pfeffer.com. I'm Mark Pfeffer. Do you love news about LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, and just about every other recruitment tech company out there? Hell yeah. I'm Chad. I'm Cheese. We're the Chad and Cheese Podcast. All the latest recruiting news and insights are on our show. Dripping in snark and attitude. Subscribe today wherever you listen to your podcasts. We We out. The world's best known investor and Wall Street expert Warren Buffett once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo, for a podcast known to move the needle for investors. Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel.